Genesis EFRC, a DOE-funded Energy Frontier Research Center. The work's being done in my group. I have a joint appointment between Brookhaven National Lab and Stony Brook University, about half hour up the road, for those of you who are not familiar. A work done in close collaboration with a group of Simon Billinge at Columbia and uh, additional contributions at the Beamline um, for data collection at the Paradigm facility at Johns Hopkins University for crystal growth and uh, through University of Michigan, some modeling efforts for thermal data that I won't spend much time uh, talking about today. So what do we care about here? Um, my background is pretty varied for those of you that don't know me. I mean, formerly I'm a chemist, my PhD advisor, his degree was a material scientist. We grew crystals for condensed matter physicists. So uh, we're really at the interface of many fields. But within the condensed matter physics fields that uh, single crystals have been particularly valued, especially the very large crystals that are needed for inelastic neutron scattering, uh, for angle resolve photo emission, and other very detailed characterization techniques. So a lot of success in those fields has depended on the availability to get big, very big crystals. And while these have traditionally been applied to, to fields like superconductivity, they're more recently being applied to other fields like solar fuels and catalysis. You know, anytime you want a perfect single crystal uh, surface, this is a great thing to have of a large area of a large volume. And one technique that's really revolutionized the production of large crystals, you know, here measured with a ruler, not with a, a SEM scale bar, is the optical floating zone furnace. And this is a picture of uh, about the smallest and most basic model you can find. They tend to be even bigger and more substantial. And using this technology, it's been possible to grow many large crystals of very complex materials in, in a very small amount of time, even if they're not traditional, uh, well understood materials. It's very good for emerging materials. So uh, this technology has been successful in growing crystals, uh, but it's not quantitatively understood in part because of the difficulty of measuring inside the enclosed um, system, right? You're behind a few millimeters of glass, you're at very high temperatures. So there's a lot of work that's needed to do to better understand the crystal growth process. So within Genesis, our goal is to apply modern synchrotron methods to study the floating zone uh, synthesis of single crystals. And with the goal of doing this in situ, something that's never been done before. Um, to do this, we need to simultaneously probe powder regions, liquid regions, and single crystal regions, all which coexist during a growth. And uh, through the investment of effort and energy here, we hope to better understand the crystal growth process and to gain control over it, in particular, to be able to grow uh, hard to grow phases, uh, which people have tried and failed to grow in the past. So crystals are important. So how does the optical floating zone crystal process work? You typically start with two powder rods, a feed rod on top, a seed rod on the bottom. And then either using lamps or lasers, a lot of light is focused at the interface between these two rods. It creates some very localized melting. Here you can see a, a molten zone on the right, a powder rod on top, a liquid in the middle, and a growing crystal on the bottom. So once you establish the melt, you can start pulling down the seed rod. As you pull down on the liquid, it necessarily solidifies and recrystallizes. And you balance this by feeding in more material from the top through the seed rod to keep the zone stable. Not easy to do, uh, but it's how the process works. Uh, since you're growing usually on top of a powder rod, you have lots of homogeneous nucleation. So you start with many small crystals. But as the growth proceeds, the grains that grow fastest win out. Uh, they overcome the growth. And what you want to end up with a sing is a single crystal at the end of your rod that's a centimeters long and, and is useful for the types of applications that I described. So this is called an optical floating zone furnace, but it's not your typical furnace, right? You're not setting the temperature with a thermocouple. You have some complex thermal gradient top to bottom, um, horizontally left to right. This growth is not mo monitored with a thermocouple. You're, you're just controlling the power of the lamps and you're watching what happens on a video camera as you do the growth. So it's usually two counter ro rotating rods. So you're not monitoring the temperature. You don't know what the temperature profile is and you're only seeing a visual picture of what's present on the outside of the rod. So there's a lot of room for improvement in a quantitative understanding. So we'd like to, to adapt this to a synchrotron uh, but the samples we're working here are not at all standard samples, right? The bulls we're looking at are about five millimeters in diameter. We may be interested in a, a few centimeters in length. So centimeters is not a scale that's really been talked about in this session. So how do we go about doing that and what can we learn? So if we do scans over the polycrystalline feed rod uh, from thermal expansion, we can get out the temperature profiles. That's interesting. Um, if we put the x-rays through the, the molten zone, we can start exploring the buried interface between the solids and the liquids, so this buried solid liquid interface. But what I'll talk about today is the crystal selection process, and in particular, how we can do a non-destructive probe of the crystal selection process that, you know, 
you're going to use this for inelastic neutron scattering. You don't want to cut up your crystal and then figure out where things are. You want to do that. You want to interrogate uh, the sample first. So to do this, um, I'm going to make an analogy here. You know, there are thousands of chemists that do single crystal diffraction. It's very easy to grow a single crystal and put it on a loop in a standard single crystal diffractometer. So it's routine to characterize small crystals half millimeter or less. And if you do this, you get the full three by three UB matrix. So you get the lattice parameters. If there's a strain, you can get things like that out of that as well. Thermal expansion, all of those are possible. But once you start growing bigger crystals, right? If we put the small crystal on a scale, here's a centimeter sized crystal of a battery material. Uh, this case grown out of a flux. If you want to do the same orientational analysis, it becomes a lot harder. You can't, you know, the, the crystal is much bigger than your beam. Um, the symmetry here is low, so Lowy methods don't work so well. They're optimal for cubic or hexagonal, but not for low symmetry systems. And if you're putting this in the lab diffractometer, you can't get the beam through the crystal. So if you want to understand the orientation, you have to abuse the process, you know, bounce the beam off the side, do reflection measurements instead of trans transmission. And you can get some inf interesting information out, but not in the typical way and not what the software is typically designed to do. So we've sort of taken the same philosophy here. When we have these really big crystals, we're going to study them in a synchrotron, in this case on the 28 ID powder diffraction beam lines of the NSLS2. But it's a single crystal sample and we're looking them on a powder diffraction beam line, so this is not, not the normal thing, right? Doing some of these measurements recently, we found that we had to put in every single last attenuator of the beam and we're still, uh, even with a beam attenuated by a factor of a thousand, we're still saturating the detector. So it's not a, a normal sort of experiment. But some nice things about working at the NSLS2, the high energy x-rays can penetrate through five millimeter thick samples, at least if uh, Z is not too large, we don't work some, with something too heavy. And uh, the intensity is very high, so we can do lots of mapping. Uh, in fact, it's normally the detector speed or the motors that are limiting the speed of data acquisition. The diffraction itself is essentially instantaneous. Um, the five millimeter thickness is presently a limitation, but uh, NSLS is building this high energy x-ray beam line which will take photons up to 200 keV, so we should be able to punch through rods of just about anything once that's constructed. All right, so the crystal selection process that, you know, the outcome of the growth should be a single crystal, and we'd like to understand how we go from this powder to a single crystal at the end. And in particular, what are the growth variables that help or hinder the crystal selection process? How can we get to a bigger crystal faster? It'll save us uh, money and time, and uh, it may affect the crystal quality as well. So these are things we hope to improve by understanding the crystal growth better. And you know, past efforts to study the crystal growth process have been typically destructive, cut up a crystal, you know, EBSC mapping of a surface or polishing a surface. So ex situ is slow and destructive, but what are the opportunities in situ? And if we actually have a crystal growth going in the beam, then we can optimize the growth more quickly. If you change the atmosphere while you're in the beam, if you change the rotation rate, if you change the pulling rate, you can more or less instantaneously figure out how this is affecting the crystal growth. So that's where we'd like to be. That's not where we're starting. We're early in the project. We've had about a day of data collection so far, um, but that's where we're working to. So I'll show you some ex situ results, but we're working to extend to in situ. And you know maybe these uh, approaches are good for more than just studying floating zone crystal growth. All right, so here's the first sample. Our first sample is shown on the left. This is the uh, product of a crystal growth run for TiO2 here just in the rutile form. So here's the initial powder before melting. We see a very dense powder where the temperature got hot and then where melting actually happened, we start by seeing a more opaque crystal. There are many different grains present, but as we move towards the end, the, the boule gets clearer and clearer. And by the tip, you're looking at a, a single crystal. So here's the boule mounted in a beam, a 2D area detector in the back, 67 keV energy. So we can punch through this five millimeters of TiO2 with attenuation on the order of tens of percent. We've scanned the sample using a 0.2 by 0.2 millimeter spot size and also a step size. So the region we're probing was about five by 40 millimeters, four centimeters. So that's looking at about 10,000 grid points. And here it's proof of principle. There was no rotation of the sample. So we're looking at a single two dimensional map. Um, in an actual crystal growth, the rods tend to be rotated during collection. So this is a nice match with a synchrotron correct. A collection, right? If your crystals all, are already rotating, this is well matched with the data collection you may want to go as you move more from 2D mappings towards uh, 3D probes of the sample. Uh, so this is a nice built-in feature of commercial optical floating zone furnaces. Uh, 
but those furnaces cost, you know, a quarter million dollars to a half million dollars. You're weighing 100 kilograms to 1,000 kilograms. So it's not the easiest thing to mount in a synchrotron and just uh, start a data collection, right? On, on top of punching through the windows and the bright light. Um, so we're starting with approximates of the flow to zone growth and we're starting with ex situ experiments. So here's our single crystal growth pool we scanned from the top to the bottom. If we look at the resulting diffraction patterns, we can see at the top, we see one spot clearly. As we move down and sample more grains, we see more spots. And if you keep on going, you end up in the powder regimes, although it's still a pretty granular powder, since it was annealed at very high temperatures, right? It was in close proximity to melting. So the existing software is designed to deal with either single crystal or powder rings in general. So here's where we were working with the Billings group to try to get a, a software that could deal with this more complex um, mixture of phases. And the way that we're studying the crystal selection is through grain tracking. Um, so if we're working in the more single crystal regimes, if there's a given spot, as the beam is scanned over the crystal, we can ask what other regions of the crystal have the same diffraction spot. So for any single one HKL reflection at a given azimuthal angle around a ring, uh, we can make a map of the grain by asking which pixels have intensity at that position. So to do this, we uh, utilize the existing peak finding functionality of the track by package, as well as some blob finding to stitch things together. So it's a pretty simple approach, but it's an effective approach and a, a robust approach, as I'll show you in the images. All right, so uh, here are some of the maps reconstructed from uh, 10 different reflections. These are the 10 most intense reflections. We can assign HKL labels based on the despacing 310, 522, 501. To make a correspondence here, uh, if we're looking at a 310 reflection, this is the shape of the grain, crystal grain, that has the 310 reflection. And we can see the polycrystalline region as well, since it has rings, it has intensity at the spot position because there's intensity throughout the ring. So we can see a sharp flat interface between the, the powder um, rod, the seed rod, and the crystal growth afterwards. And here's an example of a grain that started small, it grew bigger, but was terminated by another grain. Uh, this reflection grew for just a, a couple of millimeters and it was fully terminated. Here's a grain that grew um, continually and expanded to the full width of the crystal. So this is the one winning grain. Here's another grain that was terminated. We can see a fairly linear interface at the end. And we can see um, so certain features, like here's the biggest grain, it shows up for more than one reflection, a 501 and a 211 reflection. If we take all the most intense grains found this way, we can reconstruct the shape of the bool. It's a bit crude, but we see that we can uh, map up the entire volume of the crystal, at least through a two-dimensional cross-section. And we see that things were narrowed at the tip. That um, nucleation occurred, it appears, only within a couple millimeters near the sample, of the center of the sample, and didn't occur radially. So understanding how nucleation occurs um, is helpful in this process. And if we can do this in the beam, right, control of the nucleation initiating the growth is the hardest part of the process. If we can follow it on a beam, this will provide some real advantages. Um, so this is what we've seen so far. Uh, one can also envision that if we measure the, the grain distribution at the beginning of the growth, we can um, predict how the growth will evolve. So within the first couple of millimeters of growth, we can make some predictions about the outcomes. So if we figure out the orientation dependence of the TiO2 growth rate, that will allow us to model and make predictions. So that's work that we're um, working on ramping up as we get more and better data. So these are intensity maps of the different grains. And one thing that's noticed is that many of the grains have these odd intensity bands in the middle. The bands are in different positions. If we see the different reflections for the same grain, the banding is not the same. So here's a one band, here's a, here's a somewhat different band in a different perspective. So we ascribe these bands to mosaicity effects. You know, um, the, the beam is pretty high resolution delta D over D. We're on 10 to the minus three, something like that. So we're not seeing the full range of spot intensity when we measure a reflection. So we've tested this in follow-up experiments with some rocking curves, uh, fairly fresh data. I apologize, um, not everything's precisely labeled. But if we do a rocking curve in the crystal, we scanned over about one degree in 0.01 degree steps, we see the intensity goes up and down very sharply. And even on the order of a 0.01 degree steps, we can see some pretty massive variations in intensity. So if the crystal has some mosaic spread, that the beam is very sensitive to these differences. And we see some funny things, right? We go up and down, we have a gap. And if we rotate some more, then we start seeing the crystal again. So it's not surprising that we're seeing this intensity features in the banding. We're presently testing out precession measurements um, 
that may average out some of this. This may, may make the measurement easier. We don't have to worry about our signal disappearing if, if we if the crystal uh, mosaic um, orientation sh shifts by a tenth of a degree. So we're uh, still optimizing data collection, but it does say that this approach has utility for investigating crystal perfection. We're not just looking at where the grains are, but we can see how perfect the grains are. And we can ask questions like, how does the interface between crystals or strain affect the uh, perfection during the growth? So hopefully this is a route towards moving towards higher quality crystals. Um, so what we have here is not sophisticated. It's a single map without um, rotation, so we don't get a full mosaic matrix. But we can see things like over a single grain, we can see a continual azimuthal spread from top to the bottom uh, if we just look at rotation around, uh, around the powder ring. But that's, that's work that we'll be um, developing further. All right, so we're, we're, getting, we're getting this data. Uh, we've had ex situ studies, and we're working towards developing infrastructure needed to study crystal growth in situ. That's our eventual end goal. So as I said before, these floating zone furnaces are really expensive, quarter million dollars, 100 kilos or more. Uh, so we've been doing some very simple approximants. Here are $100 worth of lamps, a rod suspended in air. So this is the same sort of focused light heating at a point. So this allows us to uh, mock up and, and reproduce the environment and turn up to a furnace. You know, Mark II design is, is sealed. Mark III is moving towards dual rods. And pretty soon we hope to have a systems where we can both heat up to melting and rotate and thus carry out a crystal growth in the furnace. But we're probably still um, a year away from that. But this is enough to get initial data. From our scans, we can do things. There's two minutes left. OK. Uh, all right, pretty much done. Uh, so we can pull out temperature profiles and we can get temperature profiles within a quarter of a degree by the same sort of process of mapping the beam on the sample. Uh, and then again, with our Michigan collaborators, we've built up models for the temperature profiles. Those are the fits, the dashed lines, and the, the models and the experiments match very well. So going forward, our next steps are try to move towards inline analysis. You know, Right now, we're taking diffraction patterns, fitting them, extracting temperatures that's done after the experiment. We'd like to get temperatures while we're doing measurements. We want the infrastructure for in-situ crystal growth, and we eventually want to move towards autonomation, where the feedback and measurements can help guide and shape the growth. So this is the work of the Billings Group. You know, the, they built existing pipelines for taking powder data and pulling out diffraction patterns and PDFs as the data is being collected. And uh, the vision for the future is to do the same sort of thing with um, crystal growth to, to build up this infrastructure to make it robust, so that we can follow um, how grains evolve during a crystal growth during experiments. So with that, I'll conclude um, our work on temperature distributions. That's Journal of Applied Crystallography. Grain tracking, this is a recent chemistry materials. And we're moving towards in-situ crystal growth. Thanks to DOE for funding, NSF for supporting the Crystal Growth Center, and a DOE for the NSLS2. Thank you for your time. And I'll answer any questions I have time for. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And very interesting talk. There's, I see Henning has a question. I wonder, um, are you, would you also be interested in mapping uh, defects and I mean, in particular dislocations uh, in your specimens? All right, so I'm not a material scientist by training, so defects are not my thing, but it's certainly been noticed that in crystal growth, there's sometimes inclusions and sometimes problems happen on pooling. So understanding the origin of those is definitely an issue. And, you know, well, Personally, I haven't worried about defects, that we do care about the crystal perfection and the mosaic spread. And if, if paying attention to defects and dislocations helps um, mitigate that, those are things we very much care about. Well, maybe just also a comment. You're uh, going to the route of having a small beam and scanning. A suggestion would be to look into methods having a wide beam, a large beam, and doing this by imaging. So I think. That would be an opportunity for new type of samples. There's also lab-based grain mapping techniques, which would probably very well apply to your case. It's tough with the large sample size. The five millimeters is not that easy to punch through. But certainly it was nice seeing earlier talks on this uh, diffraction contrast tomography. So techniques like that certainly would be um, applicable and useful. We've seen them done with neutrons. I uh, haven't, haven't seen x-rays done on these types of samples, but Yes, if you can map the whole sample at once, that's definitely of great interest to us. Thank you. I think while well, time is running, uh, I will close uh, the discussion on this talk. Uh, 